Welcome to the first of eight lectures on Immanuel Kant's The Critique of Pure Reason, uh, the first critique, otherwise known as the first critique. Um, I mention this book so often in interviews, in the monologues I've done, in my writing, that I felt it was time that I did some lectures on it so that people who perhaps haven't really tackled it yet have opened it and thought, there's no way I can tackle this, M might find a way to access it uh, through these lectures. Right, so firstly, why am I talking about this? Um, Obviously, it's renowned as one of the most important philosophical texts ever written. Um, I would regard it as the most important philosophical text ever written because the leap that Kant finally makes is one that so many philosophers just came close to but just didn't have, whether it was the means or the understanding to do so. Kant finally does it. Um, we'll get to what that sort of leap is in later lectures. Um, as for the short, sort of a little bit of admin here... Um, I am using the Hackett edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, translated by Pluar. Um, I haven't actually read any of the other editions, um, so that's the one I'm using. So when I reference things, that is the edition that I've been using. So the recommended reading for this lecture is the Critique of Pure Reason, not the whole thing, don't worry. Just the prefaces for the first and second edition. So Kant's born in 19, uh, sorry, not 19, 1724. He publishes the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781, uh, and then publishes a, another edition in um, later on in 1787. Now, the second, the first and second edition are combined in the Hackett edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, and they're combined in basically every edition now, um, with A referencing the first edition and B referencing the second edition. The second edition sort of comes in and clears up and actually makes things a lot more accessible for the first edition. I'm not really going to go into too many of the details between the two. That's more of um, a historical reading and an evolution of the you know the intellect of Kant and where the philosophy is going. I'm just interested in the, the sort of the end game, the the full thing that we have now, which Kant obviously approved because he published it. So the prefaces for the first and second edition, I would recommend reading. There is a, an essay um, by Kant called What is Enlightenment, which I would recommend reading. And there is a few other things which I would like to state. So, firstly, if you want something short to overview this whole pro project, which is something Kant actually wrote um, to sort of overview it and make it a bit more accessible, is uh, the, the Pro Legomena to any future metaphysics. Um, I would recommend... This is, once again, is the Hackett edition. Um, I'd recommend reading pages 15 to 22 of this. And this edition actually includes a letter, letter to Marcus Hertz. I would recommend reading that as well um, as an introduction. Now, I'm indebted with these lectures to a few other resources. Like, I did not come up with all this understanding myself. This is sort of years of understanding from really great resources combined. Um, so I've used Sebastian uh, Gardner's Kant and the Critique of Pure Reason. Now, if you want to get into the nitty and gritty of the real detailed aspects of the Critique of Pure Reason, this book is good. Um, I probably won't use it again. It's really not my thing, and it doesn't actually make the it, it doesn't make what Kant is actually doing very accessible. And I think this is the problem a lot of people have with the Critique of Pure Reason is it's all very well knowing all these detailed terms and the system and, this, you know, the systemization of it all. Um, you know, what's a schema, what's an axiom, what's um, all these separate little things, all the synthetic a priori, blah, blah, blah. It's great understanding what these terms do, but without the, the sort of ability to cohere them and understand why that's so important, it's sort of useless knowledge and won't get you too far. I mean, it's interesting, but... What I'd like to do is say, like, no, no, here's really what, why the critique is so important. So I've used that text. I'm also indebted to some lectures by um, a guy called Dan Robinson. Now, these lectures are on YouTube, and I consider them some of the best lectures on Kant. Uh, there's two which aren't too great, but the rest are 10 out of 10 in terms of you, you could listen to them and feel like you're really getting somewhere. There's another book that I would uh, I would that I would recommend, which I consider the best book on Kant I've read, which is Accessing Kant, A Relaxed Introduction to the Critique of Pure Reason by J.F. Rosenberg. Um, this is a little bit harder to come by these days, um, but this is the book which made a lot of Kant stuff click for me. Now, 
If you're interested in Kant himself, there is there might be some other biographies, but the go-to biography is by a guy called Manfred Kean, spelled K-U-E-H-N. Now, a lot of scholars, um, Herbert Dreyfus is one, who says, oh, Kant's life was, just wasn't interesting. He like lived in Königsberg, he basically just lived there his whole life and he died. This isn't really true. Um, just because he didn't get up to anything, you know, amazingly astounding, his life is still really interesting. Um, he's a very strange person. He's a very lovable person. Um, and actually, apparently, he's really funny uh, in personal life. But I would emphasize the strange bit. And I would em em I really emphasize the systematic aspect of Kant himself. So these are the things I'm sort of indebted to. And that's what I'd recommend you to read. But jumping in, as I said, this is published in 1781. And, you know, what does this mean for the critique, the critique of pure reason? Well, it's being published amidst the Enlightenment. You know, an era when science had culturally overtaken metaphysics, right? In terms of what's accepted in intellectual culture. Right? Any attempt at a system of metaphysics, such as the critique of pure reason, would be overlooked or ignored. That's not something that was really happening then. We're, we're, this is the height of rationalism, the height of rational science. And Kant is really battling from a, a smaller corner here, a bit of the underdog in a way. And what Kant really, I think, gets in, finds a foothold by saying, you know, by making it clear and by saying that he believes that we're always doing metaphysics whether we like it or not. And actually, all this stuff we're doing in the Enlightenment, all this, this science that we're doing, this, whether or not the results are correct, whether or not there are consistent results, what we truly know about it in, a, in an epistemological sense, you know, what we know, that's the, what epistemology is, the study of how we know what we know, this is sort of useless unless we have a foundation as to why we are truly getting these consistent results. So, for instance, in the terms of science, you may have some methodology, you know, you could box it off, you may have some methodology where every time you do A, you get B, now, that works within that very boxed-off methodology, but why does that work altogether? Why does that happen? Um, and this is really, I think, how Kant really got a foothold in being able to bring forward a whole system of metaphysics in a time when it really wouldn't have been taken seriously, or at least not popularly. Now, Kant's philosophy, uh, the philosophical aspects, broadly speaking, are historically situated in relation to rationalism, the rationalism of Leibniz, and empiricism, that of David Hume and Isaac Newton. Now, Newton is obviously in this scientific enlightenment phase, which I'm, which I've sort of been talking about there. Hume is the one that primarily, I think, is the, is the real mainstay of who Kant is constantly in conversation with, with the critique. Leibniz as well. But Hume is the one who's constantly drawn back to sort of make progressions in philosophy. So even though Kant is concerned sort of in a secondary sense with the opposition of rationalism and empiricism, his actual primary philosophical concern is re regarding the Enlightenment, the notion of reason. Right? Because this is what the Enlightenment is built on, is this idea that we can reason everything, um, that science is brought about by human reasoning, this idea of reason in the 18th century. Now, the Enlightenment, even though I've mentioned it a few times here, is a tricky term. It doesn't, it sort of a falsely applies uh, a homogeneity, you know, a coherence, which you probably wouldn't find in historical practice. It doesn't really exist in history in, as, oh, this is suddenly the, the Enlightenment. Um, it takes most of its inspiration from the scientific revolution of the prior centuries, and Kant's project actually opens the path towards a critique of this, towards a critique of scientism. Though this comes much later, much, much later in the history. But this is why this book's so important, is it, it opens up the, the next, you know, 300 years, a bit less, of philosophy. And I would personally argue, unless people are purely just ignoring this text, obviously this is how philosophy works to a certain degree, but Kant, the Critique of Your Reason is such an important book that I don't, either everyone is dealing with it in a certain way and moving from it, or people are dealing with it in a in a way that they are trying to refute it. Um, and of course you could say, well, that's how philosophy works, people build. But there isn't text where almost it's like a given that you would have to deal with this idea. Um, so many will argue that Kant is 
attempting to put metaphysics atop a scientific or syst- systematic foundation. This makes sense, but you, you can't be too quick to agree with it before we've, you know, we have to do the Kantian thing here and say, okay, we could say we're putting metaphysics on top of a scientific foundation or um, something along these lines. We're sort of systematizing metaphysics. Kant's sort of thing here would be what's metaphysics, what's science, right? We can't really go forward until we assess what the conditions are for these things. Um, what, com- what comes from this, uh, which is something that Paul Robinson notes, and anyone who reads Kant's biography or knows Kant well, is what Paul Robinson calls a veritable mania for system, right? Anyone who's had even a tertiary glance at the opening of the critique will notice it is highly systematized to the point of like a, a neurotic systemization. And Kant understood this. We can't really go into this willy-nilly. We can't just sort of randomly try build something. There has to be this means to have a reasoning as to why there could be an objective foundation for experience altogether. And we can't just attend to that from our experience. So we have to work backwards and systematize us to make sure that we, you know, we truly haven't made a mistake. And actually in one point of uh, early on in one of the prefaces, Kant actually says that if any single bit of his system is wrong, the whole thing falls down. Uh, the whole thing would be wrong. Um, so Kant does this, but this isn't like a one-off for Kant. He is systematic to the point of madness. You know, everyone knows the story of people in Königsberg setting their watches to Kant, not the other way around. Every time he left his door, uh, I believe it was 3.30 p.m. every day for his evening walk, everyone knew it was that time. And there is a load of other strange anecdotes to do with his organization, his systemization in his everyday life, which make you realize that, you know, he was someone who truly wanted to understand what it was to be objective. Um, and of course, the other reason for this is the, the the reason of attempting what outspokenly or sort of even perhaps unspokenly was deemed not really possible. You know, this idea of an objective metaphysics. Um, so beginning with the text itself, the critique of pure reason, is a matter of beginning with critique itself, that, that term. So Kant observes in the beginning of the critique critique of your reason that we we constantly have to like retrace our steps with regards to metaphysics and we haven't really made much progress um at all with regards to our metaphysical understanding of the world um against this is this notion which comes from Kant, not from Kant himself though p- potentially becomes anyway the famous notion of the copernican revolution of philosophy so copernicus is the person who makes us realize that we're not the the center of the universe right metaphorically speaking you could look at it as from a scientific angle but i think from a philosophical angle copernicus is that person who makes makes us realize that the you know the sun revolves around the earth and it's not everything revolving around us there isn't this solipsistic vision so beginning from copernicus um we're not the center of the earth this is a copernican revolution so what's the copernican revolution with respect to kantian philosophy well, I would put it in short, which is, it's a reversion of understanding, where knowledge no longer conforms to objects, but objects conform to knowledge. So what does that mean? Well, there's a subject with the subjects, and there's a it's an object, phone or something. Usually it's understood that uh, there are objects, and our knowledge conforms to them. The reversion here, in the sense that we no longer become the center of our, even you know our own faculties or existence is the object conforms to knowledge the of the the, the re- relationship is reversed so the object comes in and then we process it not the other way around I'll go more into this into this obviously this is super super important that is to say though that our very perception subjectively intuits that which we perceive as being real what does that mean subjectively we perceive existence, not objectively. But we are the subjects. Existence might be there, might not. There might be an external world, there might not, we'll get to that. That has to pass through the filter of the senses, the mind, what we're doing, how we apprehend it, all these things I'll go into. So 
it's, you know, a lot of people like to use the metaphor of like a pair of shades. You put on some sunglasses and everything in the world is then seen through them. This is our brain. This is our mind. The, the existence, is, whatever existence is, is there. But before we can even apprehend it, sense it, it has to pass through our means of sensing it. So whether or not we're actually dealing with the true objective reality, this is Kant's sort of big question. So Kant isn't taking on uh, productions, creations or ideas, you know, of thought. He's assessing the methods, the calculations, the measurements of our mode of understanding. He's attending to the conditions which make experience possible. The conditions which make sensing and th thought possible altogether. It's all very well saying we have this. And it's all very well trying to explain how you got to this. But what are the conditions which allowed you to get to this? What are the conditions which allow me to sense, to even experience? So it's once again this reversion of you don't begin from experience and then assess the conditions from an already conditioned experience. You assess the conditions and then you you can tackle whether or not experience is objective. Um, so it's once again, this retracing our steps right back to, you know, as far back as we can go. So once reason critiques its own reasoning, we're sort of halfway to solving the, pro the metaphysical problem. Thus, for Kant, we need a critique of pure reason, uh, which pure in the Kantian sense, meaning that it do does not pertain in any way to sensible or empirical experience. So we have this sensed experience, this, this you know, physical, empirical experience, we need a critique of reason, which is pure reason, reason which is not indebted to the sensible world. Because obviously, if we're reasoning about the sensible world, we're already in something which is conditioned. So we have to go back to a reason which isn't conditioned on, on the sensible. It's the conditions themselves which allow that. So a critique of pure reason. Now, I'll get to this a bit later, but critique doesn't mean like a film critique, like criticizing that. It's actually a legal terminology Kant was very fond of legal terminology and Robinson points out actually that he loved um, border disputes which sort of goes along with the idea of you know the phenomena of Numena which we'll get to but anyway for now moving on um, this first quote here is this idea of reason in relation to the Enlightenment our age is says Kant in special degree the age of criticism, and to criticism everything must submit. Religion, through its sanctity, and law-giving, through its majesty, may seek to exempt themselves from it. But they then awaken just suspicion, and cannot claim the sincere respect which reason accords only to that which has been able to sustain the test of free and open examination. That is to say, Kant is going to truly grind down to the kernel of existence of reason itself. And this basically outlines how he's going to go about things in a systematic way. The project of the critique can be seen as targeting itself against sort of three currents of philosophy with a, an odd fourth one which is built from it. Um, these were defined by a living Kant scholar, really great scholar, called Karl Amerix. Um First current that we're dealing with, and arguably sort of the most thorough one, like I've said, is the one of David Hume, the empiricist or empirical philosophy of David Hume, or the sceptical empirical philosophy of David Hume would be sort of the full title there. Um, I say most thoroughly because this is the one I think that he's, as I said, constantly in conversation with. Now, Hume's sceptical empirical philosophy can be characterised by separating reason and nature, which prior to Hume was seen as unified. So Hume argues that our beliefs about the external world rest entirely on contextual custom and habit, as opposed to finding their foundation in reason. So what we are sort of experiencing with the internal, uh, the, ex the external world, isn't this like purely reason th thing, which is objective, but merely custom and habit, because it has always been that way. We accept it to be that way, which doesn't actually mean that it truly is that way. We'll see what this means when we get to causation. So for Hume, we experience the external world mediately and not immediately. That is, there is some form of mediation 
for Hume between the external world and what we are, what we what we end up with in experience. Now, there's so many philosophers that truly get close to Kant. Augustine is one of the earliest. Um, arguably, Plato and Aristotle get close. Uh, Leibniz, Hume, there's loads who get really, really close. But Kant makes this leap from once again, when we're talking about it in Humean terms here, this mediation, Kant truly investigates this whole thing of mediation and the, of this sort of levels of existence of saying, well, if it's media, what are the conditions which 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 allow this mediation at all? Um, the scepticism is found at the point wherein we we begin to question that which measures the outside world for the subject. So the scepticism is the point where we go, well, where Hume, this is speaking, where <coughs> Hume says, well, I'm sceptical of whether or not we're truly apprehending, you know, mediating the world correctly. You know, we can only rely on our sense organs. So what's to say the experience we're getting is actually the true one? I'm, you know, he's sceptical of that. Um, and Humean scepticism then is, is sceptical of our ability to measure the epistemic reality of our sense organs without relying on the organs themselves. So to put that simply is, how can we say the knowledge that our organs receive is true if the only way we have to verify that is the knowledge which those organs received? So it's like someone trying to vindicate their own argument by just like repeating the argument. We have knowledge from our organs and that's all we have which can prove the truth of that knowledge. So you're stuck. Kant comes along and he says, you know, in, in his, so one of the most famous Kantian quotes, when he's reading Hume and it comes from Hume, and it's from reading Hume that he is, he says, I freely admit that, rem that the reminder of David Hume was the very thing that many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave a completely different direction to my researches in the field of speculative philosophy. And really Kant begins here from Hume's conception of cause and effect. Hume assumes the cause and effect and their relation is innate to our reasoning itself. And as such, our reason finds a universal mode of understanding within the structure of cause and effect. Kant disagrees here and he states that the human understanding of causation pretends to have generated this concept in her womb to give him an account of by what right she thinks that something could be so constituted that if it is posited, something else entirely must there be posited as well. He indisputably proved that it is wholly impossible for reason to think such a connection a priori and from concepts. This is in the, the Prologue Manor, page 7. Okay, two, one really dense quote there. You sort of, anyone who hasn't read the crit critique is sort of going, wow, I'm never going to be able to, to get this. Don't worry, I'll give you a metaphor. Kant's point is that Hume doesn't doubt the inherent ability of reason to consider cause and effect right. Kant's trajectory from here is to critique that form of reasoning itself. Can we actually say that effect can be reasoned from cause? Because obviously, if we're mediating existence, then when we supposedly sense a cause and effect, are we truly seeing the cause of that effect? Is it even that way at all? Because obviously these things have to be processed. The example, and this is the example I given by Dan Robinson, I think it's a fantastic one. On a billiard table or a pool table, as one ball hits another, the other one moves. Cause, effect. Hume argues that one can't see the third the third player. Right, so what's the third player? We have two balls, dun dun. Third player is causality, the thing which makes when that when that ball hits that ball, the thing that makes this one go over here. Causality. It isn't on the table. Hume says it's a learned Habitual behaviour we derive from our experiences. Every time we, we, we see an effect, we go back and we see this cause. Thus, when two events are conjoined in experience for Hume, we assume that one brings about the other, cause and effect. This is a habitual behaviour for Hume, for Hume, and because this is an innate habitual behaviour of our very machinery, Hume reaches the conclusion that anything may be the cause of anything. He literally says that. As we have no objective way of discerning what the true cause was, as that which we witness is the act of cause and effect is in itself subjective and built from habit. So once again, I get, we go back to this idea of the subjective reality of experience. If we see two balls hit each other, this is just a sens sensible uh, experience which we have to take in by our organs. So when Hume says 
anything may be the cause of anything, it's because we have absolutely no way of verifying whether or not that was the objective reality at all, or just the way our senses experienced it, has processed it, or synthesized it in the language of Kant. Now, the major alteration then between the empirical reasoning of Hume and the transcendental critique of Kant is that Hume discovered that cause and effect were not analytic. That is to say, the predicate was already present in the subject, and no amount of analysis of the subject would reveal the predicate. And thus they were dependent on experience and therefore a posteriori. We'll get to these terms. But that's just a sort of a succinct repetition of what I just said is that you're constantly battling with that recursion of we are just reliant what we are reliant on the impressions we've already received. So it's it's synthesized representations of reality which which have to try prove their own objectivity. And Hume sort of gets stuck here. Um, as to say, how could one derive objective cause and effect without relying on empirical knowledge? This rejection of Hume's empiricism paves the way for the critique. This is this is the big rejection. Can goes forward from here and finds a way for us to basically say there's an objective means as to you know our understanding of what's going on in experience. A critique of a form of reasoning which firstly derives nothing from experience pure reason. Moving on to the sort of second current, the second current that Kant tackles is one wherein the critique is attempting to develop the correct foundation for what is known as science. So Kant, you know, he's not anti-science, not at all. He recognises the success of Newton and Galileo and the, the 17th century scientific method, understanding that it couldn't be based on incorrect data well, you know, there's a question. Why can't it be based on incorrect data? Why isn't this incorrect? Kant's not stupid. He sees that there, you know, as I said earlier, a lot of scientific method is when we do A, B happens. You know, we do experiment A. Or, or sorry, our thesis is A. We we experiment B, and the answer is C. And when every time we repeat that, there's C. Or, you know, why is a bridge stand up? From scientific method, we've made it so that a bridge can stand up. So Kant is saying... He recognises this. He recognises there must, there must be some truth there. Because when we repeat these things, we surely understand something about the external world. We must have a connection with the external world. Because when we deal with it in this way, we're, we're constantly correct. So it can't be based on incorrect data because we, we keep sort of, we do these equations and things work out how we think they would. So we have a means to deal with the external reality. However, Kant's point is it hasn't developed a metaphysical foundation from which it could ultimately understand the claims upon which its entire legitimization rests. So it's like saying, when we do this, this happens, and it happens every time. Okay, so why, what are the conditions which allow that? Once again, we're back to these conditions. What are the conditions that even allow you to be able to work these things out? Um, the third current, which is sort of in, always intertwined into Kant, I think, uh, is the problem of ontology, the study of being. Um, existence becoming in a certain sense. Now, Locke, who's a philosopher that Kant is dealing with in a certain way, his nominalism was the position that we never truly knew the essence of anything, but only understood each thing by the definition given to it by a collective. So, you know, we all we all say this is a phone, we all agree it's a phone, so the definition, the very ontology of that thing becomes this nominalist um, object. Now, the the very the problem there with this Lockean view is, of course, we all understand that, well, okay, we've all defined it as a phone or we've all defined it as a chair, but we all still understand that there's this very essence of the thing which we haven't actually got to. So the question then of this on this second current of ontology is, well, what's really what's really there? I know anyone who's sort of glanced with Kant, or played around with Kant, or read Kant before, will understand, ah, we're talking about the noumena. Yeah. Um... The fourth one is put forth by the scholar again, Karl Amerix, um, and this is a transcendental option. Now, I'm not really sure if this is seen as an option of what he's dealing with, uh, as, as, as much as it's something that he creates from these investigations. Um, the transcendental option is one which allows for an investigation into the epistemological legitimacy of science, as well as other, you know, images of the world. So, the transcendental option, or method, the transcendental method is one whereby we don't accept the conditions of experience, but assess the very conditions themselves. The term transcendental is somewhat of a neologism for Kant, um, which is done purposely in relation to the idea of the transcendent. 
Now, to the annoyance of many undergraduate students, these terms obviously are extremely alike. They seem to be alike, but they really aren't. They, they differ quite wildly. And when you get into the nuances of them, they differ drastically. Um, and it's important to never mix them up, because really, once you mix them up, you're, if you wrote a paper and replaced transcendental with transcendent, the, the, the meaning of it could actually be reversed. Um, I think transcendent is the very common one. People say, oh, it's transcended. Um, transcendent is something of which, you know, transcends experience beyond or above the range of normal or physical human experience. Now, already we can see why for Kant this would be a problem is because if someone said, oh, I've gone beyond the range of human experience, well, that experience that they, which was apparently beyond, was still sensed. So in what sense is that beyond the, the range of human experience? It isn't. So there's a problem there for Kant. But he doesn't deny, he can't deny, there's no verifiable way for Kant to deny that beyond, that possibility of a beyond. Um, so, you know, all he says is, this is off limits. We'll never know it, we can't know it, because anything we experience isn't beyond. Every Anything we experience is, is, is here. It's normal, physical, human experience. We can't talk of it. Um... It might be able to reach in a leap of faith or belief or in imagination or in fantasy, but it's not knowable. It's not knowledge. Knowledge, for Kant, there needs to be an experiential basis, which is thus not transcendent and entirely within the realm which it was supposedly would transcend. Um, this current, then, is arguably within all the other currents and isn't necessarily something Kant is in you know, conversation with. As much as something that really he's creating. Um, one thing to to point out, make clear here is um, the project Kant's project. The metaphysics is this isn't psychology. It's not brain functions. It's not philosophy of the mind or neurophysiology. Um, so if at any point you think, oh, that's a way that the mind's working or something along these lines, you're getting caught back up into the sense experience um, and you're on the wrong track. Um, a lot of people sort of confuse Kant with, with a, as an investigation into how the mind works or something like that. This is an investigation of experience itself, of metaphysics. Um, so, yeah. Moving on to the context. I mean, we've spoken about the context which Kant is, is dealing with, you know, very thoroughly, which is truly dealing with in the text. But there are other contexts going on, um, which I'd sort of briefly gloss over because I don't think they're all too important unless you would truly want it to go into the the in-depth, you know, arguments that might spring from the critique of pure reason in, in its day. Um, the dominant philosophy prior to Kant, within Europe at least, was that of Christian Wolff. You know, Kant was of course influenced by Wolff, as, as many people are influenced by the contemporary philosophers of their day, which many of us will, you know, will never know, because, you know, figures like Franz Brentano, or Husserl even, who's well known, but in his day he would have been bigger, or Bergson, who was, who was a giant in his day, but isn't all that well known now. Um, you know, Kant, Kant gains some insights from Wolf, of course he does. Um, you know, he gains the insight that we simply don't observe the world passively, and we bring with us a certain um, assemblage of cognitive powers upon all claims that we make, the conditions of experience. And, you know, thus for Kant, it's only developing, it's, it's about developing an understanding of this assemblage. You know, what we need to understand what it is we bring to experience first. Um, the cognitive apparatus, we can't just accept them and accept the experience. We need to question the actual apparatus themselves. Um, and, you know, basically from Wolf, he understands, he begins to understand at least the idea of, okay, so Wolf says we bring with us this assemblage. What is it that we're adding to the external world? This is the important thing. You might have this objective reality, but as soon as your subjective uh, apparatus, cognitive apparatus, attends to it, apprehends it, you may very well be adding some stuff. Um... So really, Wolf's philosophy was widely understood in combination with that of Leibniz, um, the so-called Leibniz Wolfian philosophy, um, and in short, the they adhered it, well. Wolf's philosophy adhered to certain tenets, many of which were alterations of Leibnizian philosophy. Uh, so, firstly, all humans have a natural capacity of understanding, which in itself is insufficient, and so must be supported by logic. Uh, the powers of the understanding are not honed via reading and memory learning, but by practical thought itself. Uh, Wolf takes a Cartesian stance. We must exist due to our consciousness of ourselves towards metaphysics. Uh, we'll get to the the scepticism of or the doubt of Descartes later on. 
Um, the principle of contradiction, something cannot both be and not be at the same time, that's a Leibnizian uh, principle. Uh, the principle of sufficient reason, everything that is must have a sufficient reason why it is, another Leibnizian principle. And Wolf also defends Leibniz's position of a pre-established pre -established harmony, a theory which posits uh, that all substances in the world causally interact with each other due to being program programmed to do so by God in order to harmonise. Uh, Kant calls this theory the pillow of the lazy mind. Um, so, obviously there's clear connections between Wolf, Leibniz, Leibniz and Kant. Firstly, on the rationalist side, they're attempting to understand experience as something intelligible, something which can be rationalised, and on the empiricist side, we're left with experiences and precepts which the rationalists state cannot be validated. So for Wolf, empiricism has no means beyond association. It has no means of comprehension. It's just that this, you know, associate this with that, this with that. There can't be this overarching objective framework. Now, before looking at Leibniz, we must understand that Leibniz is, is writing in relation to Locke, who I've already mentioned. So you can see how this whole thing is just really... Hume, Locke, Leibniz, Wolf, Kant. It's a big mess of what seems to be very tiny nuances, but Kant blows it away. Um, now, so obviously I'm not going to get too bogged down, because otherwise you just keep going back in history, uh, which is something I don't want to do. Um, but one important thing that Locke states is that there is nothing in the intellect which was not first in the senses. Here we see another little piece of Kantian coming through, Kantianism coming through. Nothing in the intellect which was not first in the senses. Nothing that we've, you know, uh, made intelligible, we know, was not first in the senses. That is to say, it had to be processed by the senses first. Anyone who's dabbled in camp will recognise this as closing in on the idea of representation. And what do I mean by representation? Very briefly, because I will go further into this in the, the Electron Transcendental Aesthetic. Representation is the idea that because we sense everything before it's made intelligible, it's a representation of reality and not the real, true reality itself. Best way to think about it, and the way I was taught, is it's a re-presentation of reality. So you could think the presentation of reality is the objective reality, but that presentation is apprehended, or touched, or sensed, blah, 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 apprehended, and it's now a re-presentation. So we may not know if it's actually the true thing. Um, however, Leibniz is, or has a sort of rebuttal here, in that there must be some active mind, some organisational foundation which allows the mind to organise experiences into something coherent. So obviously, Locke's saying there's nothing in the intellect which was not first in the senses, but obviously everything in the senses would have to be made intelligible. So Leibniz is putting forth this position that there has to be some way that these are all made coherent, uh, as, to, as opposed to you know a random scattering of, of happenings. Um, this also comes back in the, tr the transcendental unity of apperception. Sounds very complicated. It's actually one of the most straightforward bits of Kant going. Um, and this is sort of the final, you know, first historical hurdle. This point of Locke, Leibniz, Hume, where they've all got to this position. Hume with causality, Leibniz coming from Locke into this position of there must be some organisational apparatus. This is where Kant takes on, you know, takes on this sort of tumult in his first critique. And, you know, precisely what it is, you know, precisely what is the objective apparatus that must be there, which allows us to turn experience into her, a coherence. Kant's first major conceptual split with Leibniz's Wolfian philosophy is that he believed metaphysics should begin primarily from given concepts, such as time and space, and then search for the unprovable aspects of them. And through investigation, continue to define these concepts, as opposed to the Wolfian mode of philosophizing, which was to begin from definitions themselves. So once again, this is, you know, the, almost the, the, the definition of transcendental philosophy is, don't begin from definitions, begin from the conditions which allowed us to define them. How do they even become definitions, you know? What are the conditions which allowed the definitions to arise? Don't begin from experience, begin from the conditions of those that experience. Um, so Kant finds a resolve then between the historical Leibniz, you know, the rationalist metaphysics, and Isaac Newton, the, the physicalist science. So for Kant, sensibility and intellect are two separate realms. Uh, the world of sensible objects is subjective. Sense organs subject the world, we get the representation, it's subjective, the subject. 
and the world of intellect rep represents the nonsensible, um, you know, thoughts, mind, etc. Whereas before, in relation to the philosophy of Leibniz or the science of Newton, either one of these worlds, either you know the the um, the sensibility or the intellect, would have been subsumed into the system which attempted to compress it into its other, the sensible into the into the intellectual, or the intellectual into the sensible. Okay, so the you know the former there very roughly, Leibniz the sensible into the intellectual, or Newton the intellectual into the sensible very roughly. Um, now just to finish up, um, you know I'll go into the critique of pure reason's title a little you know a little bit more because you might be thinking well, so what the you know what the hell's a critique of pure reason then? Um, the the title is taken predominantly into in relation to two predominant things, critique which in translation is closer to taking something to court, um, to give an argument which would actually appease a jury. Um, you know, so you stood before the jury and you say, well, there is X, Y, and Z, so there must be A, B, and C. Uh, so pure, uh, in Kantian terms, pure means not derived from sense, you go, empirical experiences, and thus solely from the intellect, and reason, which in its broadest sense can be understood as problem solving. Um, so really what we're looking at is a verifiable assessment which would be agreed upon by a new form of transcendental logic of the very act of reasoning which is apart from the sense experiences of those who are reasoning the subject. What are the conditions that allow the subject to reason and thus have experience? One little thing on the end here, um, which is put forth in Accessing Kant. Uh, so Rosenberg sort of states that the... the, the Critique of your reason is about God, immortality, and freedom. These definitions, Rosenberg states, are, are overtaken by space-time, substance, causation. Um, in that, you know, we we don't... It's difficult to discern in the common day where God, immortality, and freedom arise from these. Um, and it's I think it's a very difficult reading of the critique to really see that. Um, and I think, you know... Arguably, the Enlightenment had the power to destroy, deconstruct religious thinking, um, but I don't think they were ready for it, um, and it was subsumed into rationalist philosophy. Um, but that's the first lecture there. We will, I will, there will be some short stuff on God nearer the end. Not so much freedom and not so much immortality. Um, but that's the, the 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 end of the first lecture there on the context and the project. Um, the next lecture actually does touch on. Um, context the the context a little bit more, but it's actually called the critical problem. Now, the project of the critique, I've spoken about it a lot here in relation to Hume and in relation to its historical context. The critical problem differs a tiny bit. So, next lecture is about the critical problem and synthetic a priori judgments. The most one of the most important questions for Kant: How are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you all for you know watching and listening, and if you have enjoyed it, um, there's ways to support below for the Patreon. And if you know if you've come across the channel, if you've searched Kant, then there's a ton of philosophical interviews and monologues on the channel. So please subscribe and all that lovely stuff. Um, and for anyone who would like the notes to this, uh, they are available for patrons only. So there'll be links in the description below. But thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next lecture.